This is Goddess Blog at goddessdienst.org. Luki Contra Baptism by Larry Bean. Read by the author. I would like to thank the Reverend Dr. David S. Lukey for providing a stark contrast between his church growth movement, CGM, approach to liturgy and sacraments, versus what Godestinst has been not only advocating, but putting into practice for going on 30 years. His undated piece, Avoid Sacramentalism in Ministry, from his What Happened to Our Churches blog, is a case in point. This article is a valuable example of why Godestinst exists and why the work of pastors and the laity in the ongoing restoration of biblical theology and reverence in worship is not only needed, but is making a difference. He begins his piece by pointing out that the local Baptist Moody Bible Station, quote, dropped broadcasts of the Lutheran Hour, end quote because of the Lutheran Hour's emphasis on, quote, baptism as a key to salvation, end quote. He laments this as a, quote, first-class communications problem, end quote. And the fault for this error was, quote, with Lutheran preachers, end quote. He accuses Lutheran pastors of holding to an ex opera operato theology of holy baptism, divorced from the word, and from the Holy Spirit. Lukey sums up his explanation of how salvation works, that the Holy Spirit works through the Word, and the water merely visualizes the Word. He never mentions Jesus or the cross in his mini-presentation of the Ordo Salutis in his own words. In fact, Dr. Lukey has a strange articulation of his confession of the Holy Trinity. Quote, All Protestants affirm the trinity of three persons in one God, a concept very hard to understand. Calvinists focus on the first person, God the Father. Lutherans emphasize the second person, God the Son. God the Spirit has been much neglected, mostly because his role as Lord and giver of church life was not needed when lively church life was heavily institutionalized. The rapidly growing Pentecostal movement of the last 100 years features the third-person spirit. For Paul, Christ and the Holy Spirit are interchangeable. He attributes the same function in one place to Christ and another place to the Spirit. For Paul, the Spirit is Christ present with us now. End quote. Dr. Lukey's assertion of Lutheran pastors severing faith from holy baptism is a straw man argument. He never cites any source of this apparently rampant false doctrine among Lutheran clergy, in which baptism is treated as a magic ceremony independent of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and presumably our Lord Jesus Christ, who told us to make disciples by baptizing them in the first place. And Dr. Lukey blames the Lutherans. Walt Kowalski was right, and acts as if being removed from the Moody radio station is a bad thing. In reality, the Lutheran Hour deserves kudos for not being afraid to confess our theology. Were a Baptist to read the small catechism's seven questions and answers on the chief part of holy baptism, he would reject it as false doctrine. I was raised in the Baptist church. I'm grateful for the biblical instruction that I had as a child, as well as learning who Jesus is and why the cross matters. The people of my little Baptist congregation were confessors of the gospel. That said, Baptists and Lutherans believe entirely different things about holy baptism. Moody's doctrinal statement is utterly silent about the sacraments. Dr. Lukey admits that Baptists reject infant baptism mirroring their snarky tone about sprinkling water on a baby, having nothing to do with one's, quote, relationship with God, end quote. Dr. Lukey also uses the curious term water baptism, a distinction often used among charismatics to distinguish actual baptism from a laying on of hands that accompanies, quote, speaking in tongues, 
which they call, quote, baptism of the Spirit. As an aside, Dr. Lukey says that he doesn't have the gift of tongues, but he recognizes modern glossolalia as valid in a response to a person who claims to speak in tongues. Quote, I did not intend to belittle something that has been a defining feature for millions of enthusiastic believers. I intended just to say that I have not been given that gift. I am appealing to a much broader audience than those who have had the experience of speaking in tongues. I gave my understanding of it as an emotional expression. Many Lutheran pastors have hostility toward charismatics from the conflicts involving charismatics in congregations in the 60s and 70s. I respect charismatics for their energy. Yours is the first expression of your prayer language being very rational. God bless your gift and the giver. End quote. Moody is also to be commended for their faithfulness to their theology. They recognize what Luth, Luth, Lukey doesn't want to, that neo-evangelicals and Lutherans have incompatible theologies of baptism and of the sacraments in general. Dr. Lukey longs for a kind of faux unity by having the Lutheran hour either compromise our theology or dishonestly put it under a bushel. Dr. Lukey recognizes the inroads of the liturgical renewal that began in the middle of the 20th century as North American Lutherans began to dig out of the pietist hole that their forebears, trying to fit in with a contemporary Protestant culture, fell into decades earlier a cultural upheaval when the English language displaced the German during and after World War I. He describes his discomfort with, quote, young pastors and their, quote, tendency toward sacramentalism, which he defines as, quote, treating the sacraments as more important than the word, end quote. Again, this is a straw man. The problem is actually the opposite of Dr. Lukey's complaint. While it is still not uncommon for a Lutheran congregation to have a service of the Word without Holy Communion, I have never heard of a service of the sacrament without the Word. Can Dr. Lukey point to a, even a single example of a Lutheran divine service that skips the Bible readings, omits the sermon, and heads right into the Eucharist? But we do see again and again, especially in non-liturgical church growth congregations, the omission of the sacrament rather than the omission of the word. In some cases, non-liturgical churches boast about their seeker-sensitive approach that pushes the sacrament of the altar to the fringes, perhaps only celebrating it once a month. I cannot imagine how malnourishing such a bland diet would be. It is a repudiation of our confession that Holy Communion strengthens our faith. And this is why Christians from time immemorial gathered on the Lord's Day for the breaking of bread. That is, until men of Dr. Lukey's generation and inclination decided that what we needed was less Holy Communion. As to the accusation of, quote, treating the sacraments as more important than the word, end quote, Godestein's print journal is immersed in the word of God. I've been the sermons editor for more than a decade. Every issue includes sermons. We insist that preaching be bound by and centered on the biblical text, the word of God as opposed to anecdotes, cutesy stories, emotional glurge, object lessons, or pop culture commentary. We also have regular columns devoted to the exegesis of Scripture. I have been to many divine services and other prayer offices at Godestinst events. The Word is always powerfully preached and proclaimed. I have never seen Dr. Lukey in attendance at any of them. This is a common straw man among our critics that we, as I heard recently, pay more attention to, quote, the proper form of a stole to proclaiming the pure gospel, end quote, and that this explains the decline of Christianity in our country, in the West, and around the world. This mirrors Dr. Lukey's theology of glory, 
in which he asserts that the number of the butts in the pews is in direct proportion to the faithfulness of the preacher and the correctness of the church's method of worship. The fact of the matter is that the editors and bloggers of Gottesdienst are parish pastors, some having been for decades, not primarily professors, experts in industrial organization, bureaucrats, theorists, academicians, or consultants about how to grow a church. And in the course of years of actual parish ministry, one sees the power of the Word of God through preaching, through baptism and the Lord's Supper, through confession and absolution, through praying the Psalms, through the liturgy, on deathbeds, in times of personal and family angst, in tragedy, in bringing Christ to bear in the midst of the culture of death and a world that is repulsed by the cross. Actual parish pastors baptize the babies, sometimes with an eyedropper. They also bury the babies and console the grieving parents who are comforted by our emphasis on baptism. They also baptize adults and, in some cases, the elderly. They teach the Word in Bible classes, in youth catechesis, and in sermons week in and week out. They bring both Word and sacrament to shut-ins and to the hospitalized. They proclaim the Word of God as their parishioners breathe out their final breath on this side of the grave. And in fact, we are so focused on the Word of God that we use the traditional liturgy. Your Lutheran service book, LSB, has the biblical references embedded in the liturgy on every page. The Church has used the liturgy for well over 1,500 years precisely because the liturgy is grounded in the living Word of God. In fact, the deviants from the liturgy are those who move away from the Word into the realm of either reason, as many of the Reformed do, emotion, as many neo-evangelicals do, phony signs and wonders, as many Pentecostals and Charismatics do, or magisterial mysticism, as many Roman Catholics do. Dr. Lukey suffers from the grass is always greener syndrome, as do many cradle Lutherans who take their treasure for granted. As a convert, I see the futility of lusting after popularity by adopting worship alien to our confessions. I have been there and done that, with all of its strengths and weaknesses. The reality is that we have the best of both worlds in our Lutheran confession, a rigorous, cruciform theology informed not by direct revelation, the magisterium, or by a complex matrix of popes and councils, not by logic and reason, not by ginned-up emotion and navel-gazing, but by the Word of God, sola scriptura. And we retain the biblical practice of baptismal regeneration and of the Lord's own words concerning His Supper, as the great I Am proclaims the great This Is, as well as retaining the biblical practice of holy absolution according to our Lord's institution. Dr. Lukey presents a false either-or dichotomy that offers us only option A, the Word, or option B, the sacraments, without an option C, all of the above. And in fact, the real, fully-lived Christian life is not a multiple-choice quiz, but rather an essay, a narrative, that is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his incarnation, birth, ministry, passion, death, resurrection, ascension, and the consummation of his coming again in glory. I would agree with Dr. Lukey if his critique were a caution against the danger of falling into ex opera operato, seeing baptism and all other liturgical acts as a work severed from faith. For this warning is strewn about the Book of Concord. It is one of the chief criticisms of Rome. And where I see it is in the good intention of grandparents whose faithless children will not baptize or raise their own children in the faith. And so pious grandparents, lovingly desperate for the salvation of their grandchildren, will sometimes inquire about bringing their grandchildren to church to baptize them independent of the parents' wishes or intention to raise them as Christians. 
Sometimes grandparents will ask about doing a sort of secret emergency baptism themselves, a situation so common that an episode of All in the Family depicted Archie Bunker doing this very thing. Their motivation is love, but we have to gently remind them that baptism is not a silver bullet, that faith matters, that like a seed that is watered, the ongoing life of the seedling requires ongoing care, lest it die. Those with any time in the pastoral office has had to encounter this real-world situation. But Dr. Lukey is instead condemning those who worship by means of the liturgy in, quote, traditional churches, and especially in, quote, highly liturgical churches, and their pastors who emphasize holy baptism in the life of the Christian. Dr. Lukey refers back to Dr. Luther's famous dictum that when he was tormented by the devil, he would make the good confession, I am baptized. Dr. Lukey cautions, quote, This can be taken to mean he relied on the act of water baptism for his identity as a believer, end quote. This shows that Dr. Lukey doesn't understand the Lutheran confession of holy baptism. Baptism is our identity as a believer. It is how disciples are made. It is the objective declaration of God of his objective work of regeneration. Otherwise, Dr. Luther would not refer back to it, but would rather exclaim, I have faith. The problem is that faith is subjective. It is impossible to quantify. Holy baptism is objective. It is binary. You either are or you are not. And holy baptism delivers faith. Nowhere in the scriptures are we taught to sever the two, nor are we to treat baptism as a mere human act publicly acknowledging our faith, as is the Baptist confession. Rather, we confess baptism as the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. To be baptized is to be born again, and in our first birth, we draw our first breath in the world. In our second birth, we draw our first breath in eternity. How can a Lutheran remove baptism from his identity? Baptism and faith are intertwined, but it is baptism that is the objective extra nos reality to which a person whose faith may be tried and frayed can point. And that reality delivers faith as a gift. The remembrance of baptism strengthens our faith. Faith is not a substitute for baptism. This is a theology alien to our Lutheran confession. I remember listening to the radio on a long drive across the entire state of Pennsylvania, and the only thing I could pick up was a religious station. A Baptist pastor was preaching a thunderous fire and brimstone sermon, but at one point in his preaching he broke down in tears. He could not determine if his faith were sufficient. He was broken and demoralized and had no objective means of faith, nothing outside of himself and his own sinful works to which to anchor himself. This is the crabgrass that Dr. Lukey is peering at over the fence, convincing himself that it is greener. And it is like the sign of speaking in tongues a navel-gazing subjective self-validation of one's salvation as opposed to the objective, divinely focused nature of holy baptism as a reality of the new birth in a Christian's life. Dr. Lukey criticizes the mid-20th century rediscovery of the liturgy as a blessing to the faith and life of the individual Christian and of the church as a, quote, wrong turn. He creates another straw man that emphasizing, quote, renewing the forms and rituals of public worship, end quote, is antithetical to, quote, the word of God itself, end quote, and to, quote, relationships, end quote. This is not only factually untrue, it is a weird display of mental gymnastics. For ritual doesn't take away from relationships. In fact, all forms of relationships involve ritual. For example, I don't know if Dr. Lukey is married or not, but if so, I would be willing to wager that this entrance into a sacred relationship with his wife was accompanied by ritual, and it was probably quite traditional. She probably wore a wedding dress as opposed to a pair of blue jeans, 
Likewise, he was probably wearing, if not a tuxedo, some form of suit and tie, a form of male vesture dating back to the pagan French Revolution. The wedding service was likely liturgical as opposed to being ex corde. Interestingly, in my experience, weddings are an example in which Baptists actually follow a more liturgical form than the usual loosely liturgical Sunday service. Words are read out of the book, and the couple and the pastor engage in a formal rote recitation. And likewise, married and family life involves a lot of rituals. I don't know if Dr. Lukey has children or not, but if so, I would bet that every year on the natal anniversary of his wife and children, the family would gather for a liturgy of sorts, a ritual involving a special meal, candles, and the singing of a particular traditional song. And far from standing in opposition to the idea of relationship, such rituals are like glue that bonds relationships. I wonder what Dr. Lukey thinks of the traditional ritual of celebrating one's baptismal birthday with the lighting of a candle and saying certain prayers. And of course, there are many social liturgies, like the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem, fireworks on the 4th, handshakes, retirement dinners, clinking glasses together in a toast, the seventh inning stretch, the starting pistol at the beginning of the race, clapping at the conclusion of a recital, eating popcorn at the movie theater, etc. All of these rituals foster relationships. They do not impede them. In the church, we often refer to the Lord's Supper as Holy Communion. It is a communion, a ritual act of relationship between believers and God as well as believers to each other. How liturgy is seen in opposition to such relationships beggars belief. Nearly every act of human relationship involves rituals, formal and informal. Social iconoclasm leads only to the breakdown of civilization and the destruction of the faith, not to mention a destruction of relationships through deracination and atomization, creating a vacuum to be filled with a selfish desire for personal entertainment and the treating of butts in the pews as an impersonal, ego-driven barometer of faith and faithfulness. Dr. Lukey displays a shocking ignorance of history and of the Bible itself by arguing that, quote, the roots, end quote, of our liturgical rituals, quote, go back to the fourth century when the now official Christian church began adopting special rituals, robes, and parades with incense of pagan worship. Pagan worship was meant to impress the gods so they would look favorably on human efforts. Quality was important for that purpose. Emphasizing those rituals led to the sacramentalism that forms were more important than the word of God itself. End quote. And herein lies the heart of the matter of Dr. Lukey's iconoclastic rebellion against the liturgy and the sacraments and to be blunt, his rebellion against the Word of God itself. While some of our specific clerical vestments have their roots in the Greco-Roman world of our Lord, the Apostles, and the pagan and later Christian Roman Empire, the idea of liturgical vestments when ministering in the presence of God is an Old Testament idea. That which Dr. Lukey dismissively calls robes and other liturgical accoutrements are, per his argument, of pagan origin to, quote, impress the gods, end quote. If Dr. Lukey were to read Exodus and Leviticus, he would learn what God's preferences are. When he appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he instructed Moses to remove his sandals as this was a place of holiness set apart from the ordinary because of the miraculous presence of God. He did not tell Moses, come as you are, or champion casualness as a virtue in the presence of God. And our Lutheran confession of the Lord's Supper is that it is a miracle that Jesus is truly present in an incarnate physical form occupying space and time. It is his same body born of the Virgin Mary, the same blood shed on the cross. It is not a symbol. It is not a spiritual presence. It is a miraculous manifestation of God in our midst, God in our sanctuary, 
God on our altar, God given to us to eat and drink and take into ourselves bodily according to his word and institution. This is why our churches are called sanctuaries, holy places, no less holy than the holy of holies in the tabernacle and temple. Why we would treat this most sublime gift and reality with anything less than complete awe and wonder and reverence can only be described by one word, disbelief. When the time came for the Lord to dwell among his people by means of his miraculous presence, the Lord himself instructed that a beautiful tabernacle be constructed, with specific instructions for top-quality items of beauty to be used in a liturgical setting. The priests were to be vested as they carried out their ministry, with fine linen, gems, and colorful cloth of superlative workmanship. God's house was to be adorned in the finest of silver and gold and other metals, with beautiful fabrics and artwork. And there are also liturgical instructions regarding ordinations, daily and weekly worship, and an annual calendric cycle. And it is impossible to read the Lord's worship preferences and not come away convinced that God prefers liturgy, ritual, beauty, reverence, and yes, quality when it comes to His presence on earth. There are no examples in Scripture of the miraculous presence of God being accompanied by come-as-you-are casualness and an entertainment emphasis. And there was also incense. Incense is a powerful image, the use of which is mandated in Old Testament worship, is referred to in Psalm 141 as symbolic of prayer, was presented to our Lord by the Magi, was part of our Lord's ritual of his burial, and is also mentioned numerous times in the book of Revelation. Incense is not of pagan origin, but pagans copied it from the worship of the true God. The words incense and frankincense appear 110 times in the ESV translation, including both God's delight in it, as well as his condemnation of it being offered to false gods or even to himself by those who were not called to lead worship. Dr. Lukey's brand of de-emphasis of baptism, his anti-clericalism, and his innovationism is the real problem in the church. It must be stamped out by constant and consistent catechesis, including by the teaching that happens by means of ceremonies, by a renewed biblical literacy, by a rediscovery of our Book of Concord and our church history, by liturgical preaching, by embracing not American sectarianism, but our evangelical Catholic confession of the traditional unchanging apostolic faith, and by rejecting the idea that popularity is what determines righteousness. This latter one is the rotten fruits of the church growth movement's libido numerandi and lusting after the ego stroke of big churches and big budgets. Can you imagine if we raised our children to cultivate a desire to be popular? Would we advise our sons to do drugs? Would we advise our daughters to be promiscuous? Why do church growth movement advocates embrace worldly popularity as a gauge of church success? Have they not read our Lord's words? Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. These two verses are a repudiation of Dr. Lukey's entire career as a church growth movement advocate. I would posit that if he has baptized one baby in the course of his ministry, he has done more good for the growth of the kingdom than his entire corpus of books and articles. And when our Lord returns to this decimated, fallen world, finding only a remnant of believers, he will not scold us for not being worldly enough, with our churches being too small, with not enough butts in the pews, but will commend his bride for her faithfulness to his word, promise, and command. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit,
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age.